Hello and welcome to Voices in Innovation from Giga Ohm. I'm your host, Johnny Baldisberger, and today I am welcoming back Chris Grundeman. Hi, Chris. How are you doing today? Doing well. Thanks for having me here, John. Cool. So uh, the reason you're back is the reason we bring anyone back. Uh, you wrote a report recently called uh, The Key Criteria for Evaluating Network as a Service. Uh, for those of you who are longtime listeners to the show, you'll remember Chris from his last report, uh, soft, uh, The Key Criteria for Evaluating Software-Defined Wide Area Networks. So we're still in networks, but uh, and we were talking a little bit before we hit record. We were looking at SD1 as kind of a uh, do-it-yourself solution, whereas network as a service, uh, this may surprise people, is a service. Uh, so <laughs> I like to start the I like to start the episodes off. Tell us a little bit about give us the 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 primer the the idiot's guide to network as a service. What are we looking at here? Yeah, absolutely, and I think you did hit the nail on the head there. Um, with regards to you know the SD-WAN reports, we're really looking at technology providers where an enterprise would you know buy that technology and deploy it themselves, right? So it really is the do-it-yourself guide to modernizing your WAN uh, and the partners you would choose to, to go forward with in that regard. Network as a service takes that basically same kind of look at networking, and what I mean is you know that we're looking for the same goals of making it more flexible, more agile faster to turn up and turn down services, faster to expand and reduce capacity, um, you know, easier and faster to respond to security incidents and, and create the right segmentation. Um, and obviously also, you know, the underpinnings of a lot of this is cloud connectivity, right? You know, as we talked about in the SD-WAN conversation, you know, a big driver behind SD-WAN and, and just kind of rethinking WANs in general has to do with cloud technologies um, because businesses don't just have the exchange server sitting in a closet in the office anymore, they've actually got to reach out to, you know, either the Google suite or Office 365 or, or something else, um, as well as, you know, their CRM and, you know, they've got all these SaaS tools that are out there. And now more and more companies are actually developing their own software and their own tools in the cloud. So they're using an infrastructure as a service or platform as a service or, you know, function as a service on and on, you know, some kind of cloud technology. And so, you know, interconnecting that into the traditional WAN was a challenge. And that's where we saw things like SD-WAN emerge. And essentially, Network as a Service, and especially the way we've defined it in this report, looks at that same you know, requirements for the network. And instead of providing a do-it-yourself technology that an enterprise can go by, it's actually provided as a service. And so it's really kind of aiming at the same goals, but outsourcing the, the work, essentially. You mentioned uh, people building their own software. Uh, and it's something I've seen for many years. Uh, Back when I worked in the food industry, Whole Foods built their own ordering system, hmm. which uh, which I'm sure it's probably a little bit better now that they have Amazon <laughs> backing them. Uh, it was a little rough at times, but when you're looking at people that uh, that are doing software development, was the benefit with going with another company service? Yeah, that's a fair point. And I think you're right. I mean, I think what you're describing, you know, really is, is what people are talking about as digital transformation, right? This idea that, at, at, you know, at some level, uh, almost all companies, especially large companies, are, are becoming software companies, right? And so, you know, whether it's ad tech or fintech or health tech or, you know, pretty much any industry has now got tech on the end of it. And basically what that means is they're doing some kind of software development to enhance you know, their user experience and whether that's, you know, some stage through the buyer journey or the actual product itself or how they, you know, interact with customers, there's, there's something going on there with software. And so that is definitely a big piece of this. And that's definitely driven a lot of the, the cloud adoption. And, and I think, you know, when you're looking at network as a service, the, the question is really similar to infrastructure as a service. And what I mean is, you know, when you're developing your applications um, or even just running, like I said, running some, some suite of office software that you need, uh, to, to keep your business running. You have the choice of buying hardware, right? You could go out and buy servers and storage arrays and put that together, you know, either get some co-location space or build a whole data center or just put it in the closet like people used to do, right? Uh, you have the choice to do that. Um, but your focus is on your customers and your products, right? And so all of that, a lot of times becomes noise in some way to the company itself, right? It's important work that has to be done. Someone's got to build it, someone's got to operate it, someone's got to maintain it, but that doesn't necessarily have to be you. And I think that's where, you know, the idea of public cloud 
which is neither a cloud nor public, but is, I think, a new form of outsourcing, or at least it's a new name for outsourcing. And so what we've done is we said, okay, you know what? My core business is, you know, ensuring that relevant ads show up to, you know, my, cu my customers' customers in the, in, the, in the split instance, right? So we're talking about like ad tech companies. And, but what my business isn't necessarily is maintaining and running servers. And so I'm going to outsource that to, you know, one of the, you know, one of the big players, one of the smaller players, right? You go to Linode or DigitalOcean or, or, you know, if you want to get bare metal, you can go to like um, Equinix Metal now. And, and so you can outsource that and have them run that for you. And what we're looking at with network as a service is so very similar, right? Saying, okay, networking, you know, I have to have a WAN. I need to connect these applications that I'm developing, the applications that I'm consuming, my branch offices, my retail locations, whatever it might be. I've got to connect all that stuff together. Like that has to happen. Um, but I don't necessarily have to be the one who does that myself. I don't have to build a team of experts in BGP and MPLS to, to kind of put this thing together for me. I don't have to know the specs of all the hardware that I have to buy and the software I need to control it and write my own automation and, and make this thing work, right? One way to simplify that is to go buy an SD-WAN solution where a lot of those problems have been solved and you just have to plug it all together and make it work. Um, but of course, plugging it all together and making it work isn't you know, a, you know, as easy as it might sound. And so what I may want to do is just completely not ignore that, but outsource it. Let someone else who's a true expert, right? When you're talking about one of these network as a service companies, and obviously in the radar, we'll have kind of a list of all the top ones. Um, any one of them is an expert, a domain expert specifically in networking and making your network work. And so, you know, I think more and more we're seeing this kind of digital economy allow this kind of specialization where my firm is reliant on your firm, which is reliant on her firm, because we're all going to specialize in the one thing we do best, right? And so I may go to, you know, one company to get my infrastructure as a service as far as the system side and another company to get the networking done. And then I'm going to do my special sauce that only I can do that I'm really specially good at. And I think that's where we see this kind of, you know, as a service exploding is because you can kind of piece apart, you have a much smaller firm with a much larger reach by using experts um, that are doing their own thing. You know, I, I think it's really interesting that, um, that I think people, overall human beings uh in this day and age are kind of masters of specialization uh you know we're still i think individually we're all we're jacks of all trades within a very narrow scope whereas like you know again we hire a pr company we hire you know because we could yes we could have a pr person but would they have the uh the access to the skills and the resources that outsourcing will have and so it's always interesting to see that decision-making process between in-house and outsource uh, and, and seeing, you know, I think a big part of that is uh, control. Sometimes uh, people want to have entire control over every aspect of a business and, you know, there are benefits and there are definite downfalls to doing that. So we talked a little bit about uh, research last time you were here. What did you do to research network as a service? Uh, who were you talking to and, and how are you going about finding the so-called nitty gritty of that technology? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the process ends up being fairly similar across different uh, reports and different topics. Uh, obviously there's kind of some primary research that I do. And usually I do a lot of that going into even before I put an abstract together. So, you know, it, it may seem simple, right, to think about network as a service as, as a thing. Um, and like I said, it's kind of an umbrella term that includes a lot of other pieces and parts. It's actually a little bit more difficult than you might think, right? When you sit down as an analyst to write a report, just defining the area you're going to cover um, is, is the first part. And that requires a lot of uh, research. And especially these days where, you know, every single company um, wants to differentiate and have a unique offering. And so if you're just, you know, when you start doing that very, very basic, very primary research and you're looking at kind of what's on the market, what are people offering, how are they talking about themselves, everybody's trying to talk about it a little bit differently. And so you don't usually see this like obvious, you know, stripe of information across all companies in the market where they're all saying, hey, we're doing X, Y, Z, especially not defined the way that, that you know, Google is going to define it. Um, and so, you know, being able to synthesize the information that they are putting out there and see those similarities and understand where, they're, where that trend is, and that's definitely the first part. Um, in, in any report. And then, and then, you know, pulling that together into an abstract is really what kind of defines that. And, and one of the reasons, you know, like GigaOM in particular, 
the abstract includes kind of a primer on what that market is. So that part I was talking about, which is defining the trend as we see it happening. But then we also go into just as you see, you know, fleshed out in the key criteria reports, the table stakes is the next thing, which is really important, which is what is the bar? What is that threshold you have to meet to be in this market, to be, to be considered a network as a service player? Um, in this case, right, the table stakes came out as it has to be software defined. There's got to be some kind of management portal. You've got to use some kind of network virtualization and it has to provide cloud connectivity. Right, so pretty straightforward. But if you don't meet one of those criteria, if you don't meet one of the table stakes, you're just not we 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 we're not considering you anyway a network as a service offering. Um, right. I usually uh, I usually compare the table stakes to a car having air conditioning in Texas during the summer. If it yeah. doesn't have it, it's just it's not a viable option for what you're looking for. Exactly right. And so uh, then we move on to the key criteria, which are the ways companies can differentiate themselves, how they can come up on top. And some of the key criteria may not be important to you for your specific business, uh, but they're all things that I think are important in the long run. Uh, secure remote access, for instance, and uh, telemetry, analytics, managed peering api can i can't imagine doing anything without api control honestly these days yeah you'd be it's, surprised that there's still so many products and services on the market that don't provide um an api at all which is getting more rare but but a, a really bad api which is mm -hmm. more common still these yeah days. uh and for anyone out there who who isn't familiar with the term api which again this is a tech podcast i don't know how many of you won't be but the, an API is essentially how various programs and websites that are not necessarily connected all the way talk to each other. The way I like to explain it is that, uh, right, you've got your CLI, the command line interface, which is really about people talking to machines. Mm -hmm. And then your API, right, the application programming interface, which is about machines talking to machines. So it's allowing software to talk to software uh, versus yeah. having, a, having a person in, in a corner. Yeah, so I, obviously the key criteria is makes a lot of sense to me uh it's it's not hard to see why these things are needed but obviously you can go into the report uh you can go to gigom.com pick up the report and you can actually read more about these various uh topics and see what and when the radar comes out you can see what has what uh where companies uh really excel where maybe they are uh emerging rather than outperforming and uh, really decide what for your particular uh, organization is really important. One of the most interesting parts of these reports to me, Chris, is the emerging technology. What's coming next? And for uh, Network as a Service, we have software development kits, self-correcting networks, and application prior prioritization. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about those. Uh, what exactly does software development kit mean in relation to network as a service? Yeah, so, you know, an SDK, right, a software development kit is in large ways, it's a set of tools that allows a developer to um, essentially program against that service, right? So so it's more than just the API. It's, it's instructions around the APIs. It's, it's potentially bits of code you can use to get started. Um, so again, it's a, it's a kit for software development, as the name implies, which the, the purpose there, though, is to really allow folks, again, to integrate these network as a, in this case, to integrate these network as a service offerings into a, a, an application. And so, you know, you can start to see some of the ideas that might pop up there, which is, you know, having your application automatically provision the, the right links that it needs, right? Since you're using network virtualization technology. You know, you have physical connectivity there, but in order to connect a user to an application or an application to an application or an application to a file store, uh, that virtual connection might not be there all the time. You may not want it out there all the time. And so you could use an SDK to figure out how to work that into your application flow where it can actually turn up and turn down virtual circuits as needed um, or prioritize different traffic over others or, you know, see uh, capacity issues coming and then shift traffic away from an overused link. So there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do yourself by tapping into the provider of a network as a service offering um, with an SDK. So what's cool about the SDK being attached to a network as a service offering is that it almost you know, blends the outsourcing of the network as a service, but also the DIY of kind of building your own thing. And so it gives you this in, in 
interesting amount of control over this service that you're outsourcing at that point. Um, so potentially it could become the best of both worlds for folks that have that need, right? I think it's definitely gonna be niche even when it's fully developed, uh, but it's definitely something we see on the horizon as more and more folks will be offering similar, sort of similar functionality. It sounds it sounds like the sort of thing I would look for uh, personally for my for my needs because uh, anytime that I see that customization is available, I think it's a smart move. You never know when you're going to have a use case that doesn't match what the out of the box product does. Uh, so it's always nice just just to have those options uh, in case you need it. It's better again it's better to have it and not need it than needed to not have it. Uh, Self-correcting networks. Uh, this sounds like we're getting a little bit into uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. What is, what is uh, self-correcting networks all about? Yeah, exactly right. So, um, and this is a trend that I see kind of across the board, you know, not just network as a service, not just networking, like all of IT seems to be going down this path, right? And I think, you know, there's other GigaOM reports on uh, AI ops, and ML ops, right, artificial intelligence um, operations and, and machine learning operations where, you know, a lot more tools and services are building in some form of at least advanced heuristics, if not true machine learning or artificial intelligence, in order to provide some better predictive analysis of what's going to happen, whether that's in capacity planning or in troubleshooting. Um, and so, you know, I think this is something that we're just going to see as a continuing and growing trend, um, being able to offload some of the, you know, tedious parts of, again, those things of capacity planning and troubleshooting uh, into a machine where, you know, so the first thing that happens, I think, is, is this kind of human in the loop where something goes on, you get some really good root cause analysis and a suggested action to take. It says, hey, it looks like, you know, all these alerts happened. It looks like that's because, you know, this router, you know, burned out one card. You know, I suggest that you go replace that um, versus having to spend hours tracking all the information down and figure it out yourself. The machine might just tell you that. And then eventually we might get to a place where we trust the machine enough where it literally is just going to like, you know, open a ticket and get somebody out there to replace that card without even telling anybody what's going on. Um, you know, that, that idea of autonomous networks is something that, you know, I think a lot of people have talked about. I, I don't know how far away it is or how long it'll take to get there, but we're definitely on that path. And like I said, the first steps are, you know, better troubleshooting, better capacity planning through predictive analysis. Um, and, uh, and I think we'll continue to see that across a lot of areas. There's uh we used to have a show on this uh on the site called Voices in AI where we discussed uh ph the philosophy of AI where it was where it was going what it was doing and it's interesting because the term AI has such a wide meaning to different people so to some people AI isn't going to exist until we have androids that are sentient mm -hmm. uh, to other people uh. Our PCs, when they shut down, shut themselves down when they get too hot, is AI. Uh, you have you have this wide gamut. So I think you know when we talk about AI, you know, writing a ticket to address a problem that it recognizes, I think that's a perfectly valid and b probably not too far away in the grand scheme of things with the uh, with the speed at which uh, technology is evolving. Um, there's one other uh, application prioritization, but I'm going to I'm going to let that remain a mystery for anyone that doesn't decide to subscribe to Gigum's body of research. Uh, there's a lot of information we didn't go over yet, uh, but there's frankly we we can't we can't go over everything that's in these reports, or we'd be here all day long. Uh, instead, I'd like to ask: Is there anything we haven't talked about that that really pushes network as a service out there? Uh, as something people should really be excited about? Well, that's a good question. I think, you know, definitely one of the things that excites me about it is it is such a um, diverse field. Uh, as I kind of alluded to, network as a service is definitely an umbrella term. Um, and within that, and, and as we'll see, once the radar report comes out, uh, I think they'll see how diverse the players are in that space. And what I mean is we're really looking at um, some folks who are doing what's, you know, what I would call software defined perimeter kind of an always on VPN, uh, zero trust network access kind of approach to like at an individual level connecting into the network. Um, th there's other folks uh, in the report who are doing just managed SD-WAN as, as, as service providers. Uh, there's one vendor that's in both the software defined WAN um, report and the NAS report 
um, just as an SDUN vendor who happens to provide that as a service to their own technology. We've also got telcos and carriers in there. And then we've got these folks who are doing, you know, what's called kind of the, I call it middle mile. I think they're, you know, outgrowing that term as they're doing a lot more last mile things now. But the software defined interconnect, software defined cloud interconnect, software defined internet exchange, kind of there's a few terms running around for these folks that are doing over the top software defined networking um, that, that's really interesting. And so, so that's one of the things that excites me about this space is that there are a bunch of different players approaching it from such different ways, right? So, so while we're calling network as a service a single thing, it really is uh, a lot of different ways to get to that same destination. Fascinating. Um, it is really interesting how, how this is evolving, not just as a technology, but as a market. Um, and for anyone who's listening, like I said, you can the key criteria exist so you can learn everything you need to learn about a technology in order to make an informed decision. Followed shortly after that is the radar report, uh, which Chris, you've already written that. Uh, it's in it's in my hands now. <laughs> uh, uh, the the production team's hands now as we try to get the last things nailed down, uh, fact checks because we do we fact check everything, we peer review everything. Because at the end of the day, we are a research company dedicated to bringing you all the information you need to make intelligent decisions. Uh, but the radar reports really provide you a market overview. You can see uh, the top leaders in this field, the people that are emerging. Uh, there are, might be, even be some underdogs that really surprised us and showed that they have something that no one else has, that they're... Uh, they're really where the new money is, so to speak. Um, but that's coming very soon. If you go to gigom.com and you subscribe to uh, the reports, you can read both of those reports. And also, you can also read the report on SD1, both key criteria and radar, as well as the massive number of reports we've done on AI that we <laughs> were uh, talking about earlier. Uh, we do have some webinars coming up in November. Uh, starting, I want to say November 4th, we have behavioral data sourcing, managing, and reaping. Uh, November 5th, exploring the market landscape for unstructured data management. November 10th, high performance cloud data warehouse vendor evaluation. And November 12th, AI governance, concepts, criteria, and credibility. So even in our webinars, we're going to be talking about uh, AI. And those are all done through different analysts. We have a lot of really intelligent, great people we work with, such as Chris. And uh, if you go to gigom.com, you can find the webinars, the reports, the podcasts, the blog posts, everything you could hope to find. Chris, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks a lot, Johnny. It was fun. <laughs> Absolutely. For Gigom, I'm Johnny Baldisberger, and this has been Voices in Innovation.